This is a podcast of uh, anesthesia for ENT surgical procedures. Uh, everything you could ever possibly want to know. Uh, this is Dr. John Eichhorn, professor of anesthesiology. The uh, mantra, if you like, about um, ENT anesthesia, as you see, is airway and ventilation, airway and ventilation, airway and ventilation. If you think about real estate, you'll always remember that because it's not unlike the mantra for real estate. But that's the thing that you've always got to remember because the head is usually covered, you usually can't see what they're doing when uh, ENT procedures are taking place, and frequently the breathing circuit, all the connections of the breathing circuit, uh, the endotracheal tube, everything is hidden from you, and that makes problems uh, both common uh, and easy to miss. Surgeons frequently lean on the chest lean on the eyes, uh, which can cause some interesting uh, bradycardias occasionally. Uh, and they can, uh, above all, uh, lean on the tubing uh, or the connections of the endotracheal tube in particular and disconnect the endotracheal tube if you don't take um, extra special care. And the issue about the eyes is always a big one with ENT. They put corneal shields in in certain of the big ENT cases, and that's, that's fine. But there have been questions raised about um, the corneal shields, and you just can't necessarily influence that as far as what they do. Uh, but make sure that the uh, shields are clean and that they put the ointment um, inside before they put the corneal shields on. Uh, there was an occasion once uh, here in this institution where the corneal shields came and they had not been cleaned or sterilized, but they were used and it caused damage to the eyes. This was many years ago. Now notice also the point about ENT cases under MAC presenting potentially great dangers uh, because of the possibility for hypoventilation. There's two kinds of hypoventilation, as I'm sure you know, central depression from the medications and mechanical obstruction of the airway. In addition, um, the cases under MAC are hard to monitor. And please understand that supplemental oxygen not only has the uh, danger of fire if a cautery is going to be used, and that's a huge issue, but um, supplemental oxygen creates a situation where the pulse oximeter is not a good ventilation monitor uh, in the sense that you get a falsely elevated saturation reading from the supplemental oxygen even if the patient is significantly hypoventilating. Uh, and that's a significant danger that's poorly understood and poorly recognized. Uh, we have the ability to, in this department to use the um, CO2, uh, entitled CO2 monitoring uh, with the nasal cannula, and it's better to use the, just the cannula just for the CO2 monitoring and not adding supplemental oxygen unless you absolutely, absolutely have to, and then only under uh, very controlled conditions because of the risk of fire. Do note that, as a summary idea, the big ENT cases involving airway surgery can be the best, most challenging, and sometimes the most scary cases that we can do. Pre-op evaluation of uh, patients like this is critical. If there's any possible question about uh, distorted airway anatomy, need for any kind of special airway treatment, um, specifically thinking about using uh, armored spiral wand in the tracheal tube, for example, using an oral ray tube, nasal ray tube. Oh, and as an aside, um, all people should know what a ray tube means, R-A-E, and the R-A-E tube, the initials R-A-E, stand for the names of the three inventors who originally created the ray tube and their names are Ring, Adair, and Elwin. So it's a RAE tube for those three guys, and it's important for you to remember the uh, names of the uh, inventors because then you'll know something that the vast majority of other uh, anesthesia people don't know. However, when you use a nasal ray tube in particular, especially if it's on a bigger patient, uh, even though it is a tube that fits appropriately through the nose, it may be too short in the sense that the uh, six and a half or seven ray tubes on an adult male sometimes don't uh, stay in place because they're short enough and when the surgeons manipulate by uh, moving the head, it can actually pull 
the tube out of the trachea, even with the uh, cuff inflated. So that's something that you always have to keep in mind. And in, for um, larger adult males in particular, you want to use the biggest uh, nasal ray tube as possible uh, so that you can have a more length to make sure the cuff stays below the cords. Um, there is also obviously um, threats to uh, post-operative ventilation in these cases, especially after a UPP uh, or with the jaw wired shut and the patient then vomits, which is always um, an interesting scenario in the recovery room, but do note that um, whenever the jaw is truly wired shut, which is unusual in ENT cases, more likely in oral surgery cases, but it does have uh, some examples of that, be sure there are wire cutters attached to the uh, head of the bed. When you are pre-oping these patients, they almost always have CAT scans, and this can be critical in delineating the airway anatomy as far as figuring out um, what kind of obstruction you might be dealing with or unusual anatomy you might be dealing with. Obviously, fiber optic intubations are indicated when the airway anatomy is uh, distorted and there's special craniofacial abnormalities uh, with some of the congenital cases, especially in children. Frequently, if you're going, especially if you're going to do uh, an awake fiber optic or, or any fiber optic intubation for that matter, it is, can be useful to dry secretions by giving some glycopyrrolate in the holding area before you move into the operating room. And remember that the uh, oral endotracheal tube or nasal endotracheal tube for that matter m moves significantly with flexion and extension and um, not necessarily in the way you might think. So th that's important uh, to always keep in mind when they're actually manipulating the head. They can uh, pull the uh, endotracheal tube out of the trachea or it can push it down in the right main stem. Occasionally uh, they will um, try to raise the head and that is um, partly to get them decreased venous pressure and they sometimes uh, ask you to do it or they try to do it and that's the kind of scenario where the endotracheal tube can get pushed down uh, dramatically especially into the right main stem. As noted, uh, as before, I said that endotracheal tube problems during these kind of cases uh, can be significant even if it's sutured in place. The disconnection issue is critical. You always have to keep in mind uh, with these big ENT cases that um, there is the potential for the 1522 connectors, slip fit connectors to come loose and not necessarily be immediately recognized under the drapes. And unfortunately, some of the uh, real problems have occurred when the low pressure monitoring on the ventilator um, is not activated in the sense there's enough streaming of a disconnect where there's enough pressure to not allow the low pressure alarm to um, be activated, but there's still a disconnect where you're not act doing adequate ventilation. If uh, any of you work with me in the operating room, you remember that I try real hard to put a firm piece of cloth tape all the way from the endotracheal tube itself around the endotracheal tube connector and around the Y connector. Um, that uh, is basically what I like to call life insurance because it makes it uh, much less likely that the slip fit connectors are going to come loose under the drapes. And remember, this is where the surgeons frequently rest their elbows. Um, which after a while can work those connectors loose. All right, uh, running down the topics as far as relevancy, um, ear surgery can vary from things uh, as simple as a myringotomy and tube procedure on a small child, um, perhaps a year, two years, uh, which will, can be done with uh, mask uh, anesthesia and no um, IV at all. Uh, there has to be uh, some kind of pre-med usually, although not necessarily because if you give too much midazolam, they don't breathe very well. Uh, but on the other hand, for uh, being humane and administering your anesthetic, um, sometimes it's a little cruel to do the, sna the sort of snatch and um, have the kid screaming and then anesthetize them with a mask because even though they're toddlers, uh, they can have uh, nightmares.
afterwards and bad memories and the f great fear of the operating room. But the one, one way or the other, inhalation induction is the way to go for these kind of procedures. Um, there may or may not be a endotracheal tube, certainly not for a myringotomy procedure. Um, and frequently now we would give some um, Tylenol, whether IV or rectal, uh, which helps a lot on the child not being as upset as they would be without some kind of pain medication. And the other end of the spectrum, of course, on ear procedures would be the huge uh, dissections um, for acoustic neuromas or whatever, um, in the sense that the uh, uh, patient has to hold absolutely totally perfectly still under the microscope because of the delicacy of the surgery and dissecting out the facial nerve, but, of course, without muscle relaxant because the surgeon can test the nerve function. Uh, true in a prioritectomy also, uh, same idea where they want to test nerve function. The complicating factor is, of course, to have the patient hold perfectly still uh, without muscle relaxant requires a significant amount of um, inhaled anesthetic, frequently isoflurane because of the length of the procedure, and that is um, the kind of thing that uh, can cause hypotension from vasodilation, so then you end up giving uh, an infusion of phenylephrine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of talk about avoiding nitrous oxide. Uh, doing the tympanoplasty is one of the few where it really is an issue. We don't use nitrous very much, which is kind of sad because it's a good anesthetic, and it does uh, ha is an excellent adjuvant for um, limiting the uh, amount of potent volatile inhalation anesthetic necessary. Um, but I hope that you'll at least not totally rule out nitrous oxide, except don't use it in a tympanoplasty. Acoustic neuroma surgery can be a uh, real problem because of where the patient's head has to be for them to get to it, and that gets back to some of the mechanical issues about ventilation and about the uh, connections of the uh, circuits. Jaw surgery, TMJ joint, uh, temporomandibular joint surgery, is becoming more and more common, especially um, doing it with um, endoscopic uh, approach, a robot now even approach. The arthroscopic uh, instruments are complex and go through the uh, mouth, but um, at the end of these cases, the discussion has to be with the surgeon as far as what did they do to the jaw, how mobile is the jaw going to be, um, has there been, an, if there's been a nasal ray tube, um, is it safe to take it out? And these are all questions that are worth discussing. Um, there have been circumstances wherein they use the arthroscopic uh, instruments to get to the temporomandibular joint where the fluid they use to allow them to view what they're doing in that joint uh, escapes enough out of the joint capsule because they're not really the same kind of capsule like there is in the shoulder and it dissects out in the soft tissue uh, and can make a huge uh, mass effect in the neck, which uh, in some cases has actually compressed the larynx and made it so that upon extubation, the airway is closed off. And so hopefully you'd see that before you take the tube out, but that's the kind of thing that you wouldn't think of unless you had heard about it ahead of time. Tonsillectomies are still done. Um, there uh, is a tradition that is probably a reasonable one. Uh, glycopyrrolate is fine, but actually atropine is a stronger, better, and a better vagolytic as far as uh, uh, keeping the heart rate going um, in these kids. Using a regular endotracheal tube is reasonable. The uh, airway obviously uh, can obstruct uh, on induction, if, especially if there's kissing tonsils, which um, are frequently the indication for doing the uh, procedure when the child has had obstructive sleep apnea from kissing tonsils um, and now is getting the tonsils out. The only problem is you induce general anesthesia in a standard manner and then you cannot mask ventilate at all. Um, so that becomes real interesting because then you go to do an, uh, your laryngoscopy to place the endotracheal tube and lo and behold you can't see anything because the tonsils are in the way. So uh, this is all again a good reason to discuss the procedure ahead of time with the surgeon and be sure you know what you're getting into, how bad is it, uh, do they anticipate um, obstruction of the airway, and so on. Uh, the suspension for the um, 
procedure to allow them to use the microscope or use the instruments in the way they're used to is difficult, especially when they click, click, click and crank that up and lift up the uh, patient's head off the table by using the suspension. But just be sure that they're not overextending the neck when they do that. Uh, there's a lot of blood loss with a standard tonsillectomy, but they coagulate vigorously and create the scar or the char, which is burned uh, surf superficial tissue over the blood vessels that were in the tonsillar bed. Um, that's great until the problems in the post immediate post-op period or even later post-op period. Uh, kids that have had tonsillectomies are at higher risk, if not the highest risk, for laryngospasm at the end of the case. Um, which provokes sort of the automatic reflex to suction to get the blood out or the secretions out, which is fine, except the act of suctioning can aggravate the laryngospasm. Um, so uh, this gets to be very difficult. Um, there is a rock and a hard place situation, no easy answer. You have to suction gently. I prefer using the soft plastic suction catheter. It works a lot better than the Yankauer and, and if the patient bites down, they're not going to hurt uh, themselves or break a tooth or anything like that. If there are, uh, sorry, if there is a laryngospasm, what are your options? Um, there are a lot of options. Uh, one of the uh, classic ones, of course, is to try positive pressure and see if you can break it with that. Now, remember, all laryngospasm will relax eventually, but you don't really want to get so far down the spiral where your patient is sufficiently hypoxemic that their muscles uh, are dysfunctional because they have no oxygen to contract. So that, I mean, that's the ultimate uh, result of laryngospasm. Uh, suctioning the secretions off the cords is a mixed blessing, as I said. If you have to use um, muscle relaxant, uh, it's tempting to want to use a little bit of succinylcholine. Then you get into the big debate about is it safe to give succinylcholine to um, male child in particular, any child, um, because of the potential for danger with undiagnosed muscular dystrophy, which is so incredibly rare that you should really never hesitate to use sucks if you need to in an uh, emergency situation. If the throat pack was in, you have to be sure it was out. That sounds silly, but it isn't, because there was one circumstance of a child who actually coughed up the throat pack as the parents were actually loading the child uh, into the car to go home. Uh, swallow blood, of which there's always some, is usually vomited up eventually. Um, it's usually not a big deal. It looks bad, but it isn't. Uh, the problem is, is that does the act of vomiting disrupt any of the char from the coagulation on the tonsillar bed, in which case you get active bleeding as opposed to passive bleeding, which is almost always obvious from the color uh, and nature of the blood. Uh, and that's most likely to be a recovery room phenomenon rather than the OR. But it provokes the situation where they bring the child back to the OR if, they, if the bleeding doesn't stop fairly quickly. And then you've got the um, situation of an active tonsillar fossa bleed in a child who's very upset, not cooperative, and has a f now a stomach full of blood, which is a potentially significant danger for inducing general anesthesia in a stat manner, uh, uh, other than rapid sequence, um, which is obvious. There's always the debate about whether um, you should try to pass an nasogastric tube to empty out the blood in the stomach. Um, that debate will never be settled. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea, but you're going to get other attendings who think it's a mandatory. Um, so that's one you're going to have to um, deal with if you see a post-op tonsillar bleed coming back for emergency surgery um, to stop the bleeding from the tonsillar bed. Mechanical airway compromise is another issue, obviously uh, more, more common in children, and foreign body being the most likely um, source of that. Now, um, there's issues about uh, whether it's a piece of meat or whether it's a peanut or whether it's a button uh, or penny. Um, uh, meat and peanuts are difficult uh, because they're soft, they get macerated, and it's very hard to get them out. Um, from an ENT standpoint, and if it is if it is meat or a peanut, um, I would advise you to use um, a 
plan on a longer procedure and you're going to have to figure out what you can do with the airway and use a bigger tube so they can potentially go through the tube instead of around it or you have to decide whether it's going to be in and out or whether you can use a ventilating bronchoscope. If it's a button or a penny or something fairly um, hard, it's pretty easy. Um, and the sense that you can try to ventilate the patient as best you can, just get the patient to sleep, hopefully still breathing spontaneously, although it's not an absolute requirement, and they can pretty quickly get down there and grab the foreign body. Um, if, they, if you use a rigid bronchoscope, which is a very good thing to do actually in extracting foreign bodies from the trachea, um, and use a side port for ventilation, beware that you need to have more fresh gas flow than you think because to, to avoid rebreathing. Um, if, the, if you do it the way I like to do it, you're going to get so much inhalation agent down there with your big uh, fresh gas flow that the uh, inhalation agent may, may have an impact on the surgeons. Um, and you can argue that that makes it uh, a good circumstance for a TIVA with propofol and potentially a little bit of narcotic. Uh, frequently, if it's not something uh, easy to grab, like a button or a uh, penny or a dime or whatever, the uh, in and out technique of uh, intermittent intubation, then ex extubation, let them work, wait till the patient starts to desaturate, put the tube back in, ventilate, 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 then let them uh, take the tube out and work some more. Um, that's a uh, traditional and very effective technique. Now, another mechanical airway compromise issue, of course, is epiglottitis, which is not seen here uh, in Kentucky as much as it is in uh, cold weather climates uh, in the winter. Uh, certainly, many years ago when I trained in Boston, it was a routine, <laughs> not quite every, every day, but almost every day phenomenon. So, the uh, signs, which I hope you understand are classic as far as the child um, sitting up, leaning forward, drooling, uh, quiet, and with obvious inspiratory strider um, uh, is, is as classic as it gets. Obviously nowadays they do uh, not only the traditional uh, cross table lateral through the neck to look for the uh, sign of the uh, swollen epiglottis but they can, if necessary, do a CAT scan, which is potentially even overdoing it if it's a classic diagnosis. But it's very important not to try to look in this uh, child's mouth if you believe or if the surgeons believe it is epiglottitis because uh, any agitation, any stimulation um, can, or, or above all, any um, stimulation through trying to examine with a tongue blade can provoke um, a complete laryngospasm. Uh, it's advisable to have mom carry the child into the operating room, hold the child in her arms. Um, and if you have an allophane vaporizer that you can lay your hands on, that's by far the most effective. But unfortunately, nowadays, I don't think many places have any allophane anymore. So um, use uh, sevoflurane is the current best choice. And uh, do a slow but... Uh, definite they start with insufflation and then a mask when the child will accept the mask and you want the child to um, get deeply deeply anesthetized but still breathing spontaneously and how do you know they're deep enough to do a direct laryngoscopy they stop breathing I know there are people who think I'm apocryphal by saying that but experience teaches that um, as soon as you actually manipulate the airway they start breathing again from the stimulation so you know it's time to go ahead and manipulate the airway when they uh, are so deeply anesthetized on SIVO uh, that they stop breathing. Then you have one shot to um, get a look in there and hopefully put a relatively small endotracheal tube behind the epiglottis down into the uh, trachea. Now, if that fails um, and the attempt at laryngoscopy and intubation uh, fails but stimulates the um, already nearly obstructed trachea and cords enough, um, the child will have total obstruction. And if worse comes to absolute worse and you can't do anything, ENT may say, well, let me try to intubate. And that's fine, and they can try it once. But they need to understand, and you need to tell them that you get one shot, and if you don't get it in, you're going to have to do a surgical airway, which they're reluctant to do, but I think they recognize when you, you turn the pulse oximeter up really loud, and beep, beep, and then all of a sudden, beep, 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 boop.
they're going to appreciate the fact that the child is in grave danger and has to have a um, surgical airway immediately. Another component, uh, a different kind of mechanical airway obstruction comes from um, submandibular or peritonsillar abscess. Uh, those can, can obstruct, hinder uh, your view, uh, hinder the placement of the ventricular tube. Having a CT is almost uh, standard these days for these kind of things, so you'll know exactly what the anatomy is in there. Uh, do note, however, that occasionally you're going to try to go to uh, routinely place an endotracheal tube in this um, patient that has a big peritonsillar abscess, and in the process of um, using, especially with a Miller blade, but occasionally with a Mac blade, or even with your endotracheal tube, you can accidentally puncture the abscess. Um, that, in some ways, can make it easier since you have more chance to view the larynx. However, you've got a, a big flood of pus that could pour down the trachea. That's bad. So you want to really try to avoid puncturing the abscess during your uh, intubation. But if you do, you've got to suck it out as best as possible um, while uh, being aware of paying attention to the uh, potential desaturation and get a tube down there and suck down the endotracheal tube. Uh, I hope everybody understands what Ludwig's angina is, which is basically uh, necrotiz not, or, uh, severe fasciitis with um, a lot of edema of the anterior neck, uh, usually strep, and it can be a nightmare, um, which they don't want to put a tracheostomy through the infected tissue if at all possible because it can actually make the ultimate outcome worse. Um, but a small endotracheal tube carefully threaded in with fiber optic help probably will facilitate treatment of this very dangerous condition. Now, in, in a situation of Ludwig's or in some of the submandibular and peritonsillar abscesses, uh, the question after the tube is placed, the um, pus is drained as best can or is cleaned out or is opened, do you want to take the tube out or do you want to leave it in? And of course with a child it's harder to leave it in because they're not going to understand what's going on. That makes it a very difficult decision that it means you're going to have to have an extensive discussion with the surgeon figure out what the best way to do it is. But you may well have to put the child on muscle relaxant sedation and on a ventilator until the next day. Uh, and then hopefully be able to have them extubate the child in the intensive care unit and get on with um, recovery after that. Elective tracheostomy is a case we see frequently because we have so many acute patients that have uh, problems postoperatively or have ENT surgery uh, that needs tracheostomy here. But um, I realize that the intensive care doctors do a fair number of these uh, at the bedside in the um, intensive care unit, but nonetheless, as, as we also know, that a fair number of these patients come to the operating room. It seems like a simple case to, to do a trach for a patient who's been intubated for two weeks or whatever, uh, and now is going to have long-term ventilation, and this concept seems simple, but it's not, uh, and it's very important while doing the uh, percutaneous, I'm sorry, doing the regular tracheostomy, not percutaneous, in the OR, that you don't pull the endotracheal tube out. Um, and, before, sorry, don't pull it out before they truly have the airway. Uh, there have been multiple circumstances where they say, uh, oh yeah, we're in, pull the tube back, and then if you pull the back tube back too far, and they accidentally uh, put the trach tube in the anterior mediastinum anterior to the trachea instead of in the trachea lumen. And then they hook up and you inflate a little bit and you get a pneumo uh, pericardium and the patient's in big trouble and desaturating and uh, now very difficult to ventilate and having hypo massive hypotension, severe hypotension from the um, tamponade effect, you got a lot of trouble. And if you can't slide the endotracheal tube right back down past the incision into the trachea through the window into the trachea uh, because you left it right above the window in the trachea. So no matter what the surgeon says about, oh, yeah, pull it back, pull it back further, pull it out, uh, don't do that until you're absolutely, totally, positively sure that they have accessed the lumen of the trachea through the um, tracheostomy incision. Uh, pay attention to that.
bleeding doing, during the routine trachs uh, is almost uh, always not a major problem. However, every once in a while, the little thyroid artery uh, side branch or something, uh, they don't pay a lot of attention to it. And that's the thing, if they don't get it and get it thoroughly, especially with a clip rather than just with a cautery, uh, will cause a problem later. Um, and the same in the intensive care unit where they ask, well, how about a little sedation so we can do this bedside trach uh, percutaneously? And that's fine. But um, if you agree to do that, it becomes your case and you're giving an anesthetic. And you don't have all the resources you have in the operating room. So be aware that this is a potential source of great trouble for you because you can be in over your head if they have trouble getting in the airway and you're uh, theoretically um, in charge of the anesthetic, but you don't have all the tools uh, and monitoring that you're used to. So it's best almost to avoid that situation at all possible. Okay, shifting gears. Another major component of um, outpatient ENT surgery in particular is nasal and sinus surgery, a wide variety of different types. Be aware that um, they frequently inject significant amounts of uh, epinephrine into the nostrils, uh, and this, in certain circumstances, depending on how much they use and how fast it's absorbed, can cause dramatic hypertension, tachycardia, dysrhythmias. Um, there's a big, there was a big debate about the inhaled uh, neosinephrine, phenylephrine, half percent, that uh, can be was used routinely. Uh, however, some of the surgeons believed that this predisposed as uh, children in particular or, or younger people to uh, possible flash pulmonary edema, so we don't have half percent phenylephrine nasal spray anymore. Using the afrin, um as an alternative is fine, uh, but there is a um, classic uh, problem with too much uh, phenylephrine uh, sprayed up the nose uh, if you believe it. Now, as far as injecting epinephrine, that's um, a different scenario. Be sure that everybody in the room understands what's exactly being objected, bec injected because uh, there was a case several years ago, which was a famous case because it was one of the first uh, cases with full disclosure and apology, uh, where the epinephrine solution uh, for tympanoplasty actually injected in and around this uh, young boy's ear uh, was undiluted um, instead of uh, dilute epinephrine and the patient got a massive overdose of epinephrine and died right then and there. Um, that was um, a very unfortunate case that got a lot of publicity, but illustrating how you really have to be sure that the tech knows what's being injected and that um, sometimes it's worth even glancing at the uh, back table to make sure there's not uh, 10 uh, empty ampules of epinephrine lined up, you know, or there in a pile when there should only be one. Um, should you use a throat pack for sinus surgery? That's up to the surgeon, obviously, but you can suggest it because it probably does help aspiration, avoid aspiration, uh, especially blood. The uh, fiber, fiber optic endoscopic sinus surgery is frequently um, believed to be simple and quick which in some cases may be true, but beware. Um, there have been circumstances in the past where um, the patient, if not well relaxed and not deeply anesthetized, uh, coughed while the scope was um, in a sinus and coughed in such a manner that the scope punctured the sinus and actually pierced the orbit. Obviously, that's a severe complication. Uh, occult bleeding is an issue with the sinus surgeries because sometimes the surgeon doesn't really appreciate uh, how much uh, bleeding is and then whether it's active or uh, so-called reactive or passive. Uh, laryngospasm from secretions and or blood from this is very common or nausea and vomiting from swallowed blood, very common. You have to factor in just like with tonsils the same kind of issues uh, and just remember that uh, in cases where there is a significant amount of swallowed blood, the patient will sooner or later vomit. This is the nature of the business. It's a uh, little blood looks like a lot, and you have to prepare everybody, including the PACU nurses, if they're not familiar with this, for that kind of phenomenon.
Pain endoscopy for cancer diagnoses are common in, in our hospital. Um, it sounds like a simple case, but it's not. And um, these scenarios are some things that lead to potentially uh, more complicated procedures than we have um, normally done. It depends on what they find, what, how big the mass is, where it is, how much the pieces they take out of it, and whether there's any bleeding created. Uh, if there is a big mass uh, in the larynx, above the larynx, um, maybe even on the tonsils, you're going to want to put a small tube in or no tube at all. Uh, however, the uh, desirability of doing um, jet ventilation for these procedures um, seems to have fallen out of favor here in particular and probably in general. Uh, there is a, a wide popularity uh, in this institution among the ENT surgeons for intermittent extubation, meaning you place the tube, you ventilate the patient, get them good and deep, fully oxygenated, and they just pull the tube out, um, take their biopsies, do their looks, wait until you um, tell them, hey, the patient's desaturating and the pressure's going up, we need to put the tube back in, and then you um, put, the, they replace the tube for you into the trachea, uh, you ventilate, get the patient deep again, get the patient fully oxygenated, repeat as necessary. Uh, some of the biopsy sites, in spite of being cauterized, still are bleeding because uh, it's uh, neoplastic tissue and doesn't um, respond like normal tissue, and this can cause laryngospasm in the immediate post extubation period. Uh, vomiting after these kind of procedures is frequently um, problematic because it disrupts whatever coagulation they did uh, and can uh, provoke acute bleeding that leads to um, issues in the recovery room that may lead the patient to come back to the OR emergently, not unlike a bleeding tonsil. Airway surgery, such as the UPP, uh, which is the uh, uvulopharyngoplasty treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, has a special challenge of edema. Uh, even though they're cutting away tissue that has previously provoked or been involved in airway obstruction, uh, which theoretically should make the circumstance better after the surgery, However, there's going to be significant edema in the throat, and that, uh, combined with the usual secretions, potential some blood also, makes these patients a significant risk for obstruction and laryngospasm uh, in the immediate post-op period. Uh, if you do a UPP kind of procedure, usually the patient is relatively heavy, and I would recommend and urge you, to, in fact, to have the patient almost sitting bolt upright when you take that tube out. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world, and they're much less likely to obstruct, and they're much less likely to have the um, secretions or blood provoke laryngospasm when they're in that kind of position because they can spit out whatever it is that's in their mouth or their throat. Now, um, the tracheal polyps, or obviously any kind of cancer of the larynx, um, is a major challenge. It involves the shared airway idea that... Um, there are all kinds of issues uh, that can involve, again, some of the intermittent extubation, uh, as described for the uh, diagnostic endoscopies. Uh, and that can just go on with multiple examples of um, the taking the tube out until the patient starts to saturate, and then you put the, they put the tube back in, and you ventilate and make the patient deep again. Good opportunity to use TIVA uh, for obvious reasons. Um, we talked about the various um, options for ventilation, but uh, the small tube through the trachea, having them work around it, is less and less uh, common than it used to be. And the tiny tubes that they would use, uh, fives, for example, sometimes can be very difficult to uh, use for adequate ventilation of uh, full-size adults. When they use a laser, um, there's always a fire risk. We have um, the double cuffed metal or uh, laser resistant special fireproof material. The question, uh, and th those are useful, and it's also useful to um, fill a cuff with the methylene blue. We actually have some tubes that come with powdered methylene blue in the cuff already. So when you add saline to the cuff, the uh, methylene blue is diluted.
and creates the um, color uh, alarm, if you like, for them piercing uh, the proximal cuff and then hopefully not also the distal cuff the second time with the laser. Um, what the uh, inspired oxygen concentration should be when they're using a laser has been a subject of debate. However, I don't think uh, there's any uh, debate anymore about the idea that you should have the lowest FiO2 possible consistent with uh, maintaining the patient adequately, and that's frequently room air in the sense that um, you can turn off the, all of the oxygen on the anesthesia machine and simply ventilate with room air. Uh, and if the patient's saturation is maintained above 85 or, or 90 even, uh, as many patients hopefully would be, uh, you're fine, and that's the best you can do as far as uh, not creating an oxygen-enriched environment which is more prone to fire. And obviously, we'll talk about it in the airway fire part, you have to be ready to treat uh, if, for whatever reason, um, uh, tissue catches on fire or there's any other material down there like a sponge that uh, catches on fire, hopefully you will not have an intratracheal tube that catches on fire. Um, if you have a patient with um, familial uh, polyposis or viral polyposis uh, getting laser of the uh, intratracheal uh, polyps, um, especially if it's viral but even potentially if it's familial, there is um, there are agents uh, potentially causing polyps in the um, uh, smoke from the laser, and you have to use, they have to use the um, scavenging device that gathers up all that smoke. Uh, there are other big uh, airway cases, tracheal repairs after trauma, obviously, uh, or whatever they end up being, massive infection with. Um, Necrotizing fasciitis uh, in the uh, neck is a huge problem. Cancer resection is, is we can do, but we're uh, we do that here frequently. We're familiar with some of those great big cases. Uh, if it's very difficult tracheal um, resection that goes way down, they may have to split the sternum, having the CT surgeons come in, and unfortunately, uh, in some of those cancer patients where they do have to split the sternum to get access to the trachea all the way down to the carina. Um, there can be involvement of um, uh, tumor extension into the great vessels, and if one of those great vessels gets torn in the process, um, that's going to be a fatal complication in the OR unless they go on emergency cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, which is rare but has been done, has been reported. Okay, airway fires. Uh, I commend the video at the APSF website because it's very dramatic, it's very important. It's mostly about um, having the patient's drapes uh, set on fire or the patient set on fire from supplemental oxygen during MAC, but it also has a section about airway fires. What burns? Well, if there's a plastic in a tracheal tube, obviously it can burn. And if there's fire inside the lumen of the endotracheal tube, if the ventilator cycles, that causes a blowtorch effect, and, or if you squeeze the bag, I guess, that can um, be fatal because you're basically blowing a big stream of fire down into the lungs. If the um, cuff is uh, violated and burns, that the, you'll have loss of the airway seal, which is a, a minor issue if the endotracheal tube is on fire. Uh, throat packs uh, have caught fire. The cotton pledges occasionally used uh, have caught fire. Those would form the fuel. Uh, the ignition source is usually the laser beam, um, and the uh, CO2 laser is the most common one used in the airway. Um, they don't use the AG laser much anymore at all. Um, it's more effective as far as getting deeper into the tissue, and it is also um, very dangerous as far as starting fires. The third leg of the fire triangle is the source oxidizer, source of combustion, Supporting combustion, obviously oxygen, nitrous oxide also. Obviously, we want to use the lowest possible um, FiO2 when there's a laser risk of fire in the airway. Uh, helium, uh, it's possible. It, there are people who think it's great. Uh, not done very often much anymore. Um, 
if the fire does start, there's an argument that it can make the tissue burn worse. Um, nowadays, I think it's pretty unlikely that you're going to find yourself using helium uh, for laser surgery. The heat, obviously, from a fire will cause direct tissue damage. PVC um, produces hydrogen chloride, which is a very toxic gas. It's basically a gaseous hydrochloric acid that uh, basically can cause pulmonary edema and is a serious pulmonary toxin. The uh, endotracheal tube, if it does burn, causes silica ash, which is a very uh, serious airway irritant. The cotton ash is not so bad, except uh, if cotton burns, you get a lot of carbon monoxide that's going to go directly into the lungs. Uh, preventing fire, we talked about the lowest possible FiO2. We talked about the um, methylene blue saline, uh, which is actually, if the cuff is perforated by the laser, uh, it is much less likely to have a fire in the endotracheal tube because the uh, saline will uh, lower the temperature and, and basically prevent a fire from starting. If it's a regular endotracheal tube, uh, wrapping it with uh, tape is an older thing. We don't do that much anymore. Um, the idea of putting a pledget down around the cuff is also uh, an older um, kind of maneuver that you're less likely to see these days, although older ENT surgeons may still prefer that. Um, Adding PEEP whenever you do that is considered a, a routine thing to do. We do, do also do that without um, hesitation. The laser tubes you know about, we have two kinds, the metal and the special um, fire-resistant uh, brown, uh, nubby kind of plastic stuff. The double cuff tube we talked about uh, because if you perforate the proximal cuff, you've still got a cuff below that. The intermittent excavation we've talked about. Um, and the, inter and the jet ventilation is less and less used, you're probably not going to see that. If there is an airway fire, obviously you stop ventilation, disconnect the patient, remove the endotracheal tube. Those basic those things should stop, happen essentially um, instantaneously. Uh, flood the field with water saline, uh, cool the tissue, which should l help mitigate the burn injury get anything that's still on fire, obviously stop burning, mass ventilate with 100% oxygen, put a new tube in, or a rigid bronchoscope if there is massive edema, uh, do a some kind of bronchoscopy to see if there's any uh, airway damage or soot or combustion products or burned tissue for that matter down into the trachea, ex ex expect the airway edema afterwards and that's a good reason sometimes not to intubate these patients if there's actually been an airway fire. Re respiratory uh, ARDS uh, syndrome afterwards is very significant if there's been an actual uh, airway fire with fire down into the lung. And that will also, uh, once that's passed, uh, there's the long-term danger of tracheal stenosis. Uh, there have been many reports of cases where there has been a some kind of uh, brief little flame uh, in, in the throat, and then everybody reacts, and the laser is still going. The surgeon still has his foot on the laser pedal. The laser is firing, and he jumps, or you jump, or the it's dislodged enough so that the laser is still going when it's pulled away from the airway, and then it sets the drapes on fire. And that's uh, been documented, so be aware um, that it, not only do you have to pay attention to the fire in the uh, trachea, but also uh, anything else if the laser wasn't instantly turned off. Okay, last but far from least is major cranial uh, facial head and neck surgery. We see more of that here at the University of Kentucky than most any other place. Obviously can be a good, huge case, challenge, uh, having a good relationship and working with the surgeons is important. You have to be partners. You're not uh, adversaries. You're not competitors. You're all working for the same goal. Severe trauma or even moderate trauma with the Lefort fractures uh, require planning, uh, discussion with the surgeons ahead of time, you know, planning, 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 and then airway ventilation, airway ventilation, airway ventilation. Eye protection is important. We talked about that. Um, figuring out what they're going to do if they're going to do big flaps. Um, anything for the flap, uh, they usually want the patients warm, they may or may not want 
um, dextran for anticoagulation or for rheology if they're going to do a flap. And uh, talking about major craniofacial surgeries, um, I'll show you the poster at the end of a re remarkably unusual case. In these big uh, craniofacial uh, procedures, obviously access larynx is, is an issue. If they have a huge friable tumor in the airway, there's going to be the um, potential for difficulty getting uh, down into the airway for ventilating the patient, which is one of the reasons that tracheostomy is very common, uh, especially if the patient's had radiation therapy for this or fractures from trauma, uh, which affect the anatomy or have caused bleeding or could cause bleeding. Elective trach um, preoperatively, while that takes a great deal of the challenge away from us, is clearly safest for the patient. Once, if you are having the um, patient ventilation through an endotracheal tube in the nose or mouth, the tube may be in the surgeon's way, and if they put retractors in so they can get to where they're working, and this is more sometimes an issue for a couple of general surgeons that occasionally do head and neck tumors, uh, less likely f an issue for the ENT surgeons. But nonetheless, um, the compression, kinking, uh, even accidental removal of the tube, violation of the cuff, or cutting the pilot tube on the uh, tube, endotracheal tube, uh, deflating the cuff, uh, undesirable. Uh, all these things are issues that you have to think about and things that you can learn uh, how to create a situation most likely to avoid this kind of complication. The mid-face advancements for a teenager with something like Crouzon's disease um, now um, used to, while well, they used to have um, normal endotracheal tubes which were fraught with hazards, almost always get elective tracheostomy pre uh, the major procedure. Um, sometimes if it's a younger patient uh, who has is this kind of condition and needs this kind of surgery, uh, doing an awake trach under local may be very difficult, getting them to cooperate so that can have intubation challenges or sedation challenges if you try to sedate the patient enough so they can do the trach under local um, and hopefully keep the patient still breathing. Uh, enormous rapid blood loss is always possible, especially for the big cancer surgeries, uh, radical neck dissections that will be not so much acute blood loss as oozed for hours, uh, poorly appreciated sometimes. The uh, hemodynamic implications of dysrhythmia from carotid body manipulations always have to be kept in mind. Um, big issue about whether you want to deliberately lower the blood pressure for big vascular tumors is great, but remember the risk of stroke if you lower the blood pressure too much uh, during this um, kind of procedure. Planning for the post-op immediate and longer-term care of these patients is critical, especially for the immediate a uh, situation where you're likely to leave the patient intubated, whether it's by trach. Of course, you can hook that up to a ventilator easier, easily, but if it's in a tracheal tube, uh, if there's not a trach, then you really have to discuss with the surgeon what the plan is. Are you going to try to extubate the patient in the operating room, which is something frequently they like, but uh, may not be a wise idea, and you may need to actually look in there and see how much edema there is because what is a little edema to them is a lot of edema in real life and can lead to situations where you don't want to um, take a chance. Uh, the external edema as a marker for the internal edema is always um, valid, and doing some kind of either fiber optic or even direct laryngoscopy before you're willing to extubate the patient, such as the next day in the, intracheal, in the intensive care unit, is uh, always smart because you don't want to take out an endotracheal tube that you can't put back. Um, so that's a summary of some of the major issues for um, overall overview of ENT surgery. I do want to show you this very unusual case that we got to do uh, earlier uh, in 2013 where this is a patient, and you can read the poster um, if you choose, but the bottom line is for complex sequence of events reasons, this patient had a... Uh, nucleation and then had radiation for that that caused a second cancer which of the maxilla which got operated on 
uh, leaving this big defect, which would not accept a prosthesis because of the very friable and uh, uh, fragile nature of the tissue that would not allow a prosthesis to be fitted. So that was how the patient lived with this huge defect open to the pharynx. And then the complicating issue was is that it was impossible to put an endotracheal tube through the nose because of the radiation changing, causing so much changes, causing so much scarring, and the radiation caused uh, damage to the temporal mandibular joint enough so the patient could only open her mouth about a centimeter. So uh, no tube through the mouth, no tube through the nose, but now the patient has a third cancer at the base of the tongue, um, and in this particular procedure needed a full mouth extraction so she could get yet more radiation therapy, and the only access to the pharynx to potentially pass an endotracheal tube was through the orbit, and you can see by the sequence of pictures uh, what we did to uh, allow them to have access to her mouth um, without intubating her nose or her mouth. Uh, probably the only time you're going to see something like this because um, this exact complex of uh, circumstances is remarkably unusual. So you can look at that at your leisure, and that's the overview of ENT for um, ENT procedures, anesthesia for ENT procedures. Thanks very much.